This is Brand USA Talks Travel, elevating the conversation about international travel to the United States. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. How many hostels have you personally stayed in? Literally hundreds at this point. Of course, switching careers to work for uh, Hosteling International USA didn't hurt. If there is a 1K club for hostels, I bet I'd be a member. My guest today is Russ Hedge. Since 2000, Russ has been the CEO of Hosteling International USA. He's also served on the boards at U.S. Travel, the Alliance for International Exchange, and the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Welcome to Brand USA Talks Travel, Russ. Great to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Your early career included stints at the Department of Commerce, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and U.S. Senate Budget Committee. What brought you from working in economics to hosteling? Seems like quite a change. It was all about a hostel in Paris on my 28th birthday. About four years into my career, I was given a sabbatical to attend a international business program in England, and I managed to add on another three months for travel before and after. And that enabled me to take the sort of big trip that many college students take during their college years. It also turned out to be a life-changing experience for me. A big part of that was due to hostels. I met travelers who were high energy, curious and looking for their own next adventure, just like me. In the Paris hostel, I decided the whole realm of hostels and youth and student travel would become a passion. When our listeners hear the word hostel, it may conjure up wet backpacks and crowded bunk beds. For those that might need a refresher course, how about a brief description of hosteling today? So hosteling is traveling while staying in hostels. And at their most basic, hostels are dormitory style accommodations with shared bathrooms, shared common rooms. They're shared lodging. But if you leave it there, it's like saying that a 1960s Volkswagen and a 2023 EV are the same because both have four wheels. There's a lot of variation among hostels. Hostels have changed dramatically over the years. These days, there's more of a focus on privacy, curtains on bunk beds, single-use bathrooms. There are more single rooms in a hostel. There's more amenities, everything from more sort of deliberate and refined interior design to personal lockers and laptop docking stations in guest rooms, coffee bars and delis in lobbies. But mainly, travelers are drawn to hostels because of community, and that's in two ways. They find a sense of community with other travelers in the hostel. But they also find a deeper sense of the community they're visiting, which aligns well with the Gen Z desire to live like a local. Mm -hmm. And they do that at a hostel through our programs and activities that are available to them as guests. How would you assess the prospects for student and youth travel in the United States? I think that the student and youth travel segment holds some incredible potential for our country. It's ripe for growth and development. And let me give you a few examples. In leisure travel, a study that was done by an outfit I'm affiliated with out of Amsterdam, it's called the Wise Travel Confederation, found that the average youth traveler spends $4,300 on their trip, compared to $3,700 for the average global traveler. So the youth traveler spends 25% more. Now, if that seems incredulous, there's a simple reason why. Youth travelers, on average, take longer trips. They spend less per day than the average traveler, but because they stay longer, their economic impact is larger. And so a question would be, how should the United States leverage that? I have a feeling you're going to give me the answer. (laughs) How should we leverage that? No answers, but there are a lot of people that are smarter than I am, and I think it's a question of putting the right people in the room together and trying to noodle through an answer. All I know is if I look at countries like Australia who've made a real effort to appeal to youth travelers, there have been some real success stories there. So let me give you another one. Quite separate from leisure travel, there's educational travel. Now we know that spending by international students who come to the United States and study here account for 40% of our country's travel exports, 40%. Now, that economic reality has led to some really amazing attention at the federal level. But what should it mean to local economies and their DMOs? That would be a a second opportunity, I think, that youth and student travel offers the larger travel industry and our country. And then finally, let's think about the challenges facing many of today's teens and 20-somethings. 
we look at the statistics, college enrollment has been declining since 2010. Today, there are increasing numbers of young people who are grappling with feelings of isolation and factionalism and powerlessness. It's not a good combination. Yet at the same time, research studies show that cognitive development during early childhood is a time when young people are open to exploring new options and ideas. That's why travel can be such a powerful education. Is the idea of promoting extended youth travel as a form of personal development and values clarification? Is that part of the answer? And what should that mean for our public policy? So those are the sorts of opportunities that I think a deeper dive by people smarter than I am into the potential for student and youth travel can yield some real benefits for our society and for our economy. What's the median age of someone using a hostel? We have one group of young travelers that average age is about 24 or 25. And then we have a whole emerging group of older travelers, 50 and 60-somethings. So the age range varies dramatically. We're primarily youth and student travel focused, though. Tell me a bit about Hosteling International USA, the history, membership, and the mission. So I think the two best words that describe High USA is a social enterprise. We're lean, we're entrepreneurial, and we're passionate about our social purpose. You'll find our social purpose on a wall mural in the lobby of every hostel operated by High USA. It speaks to our belief in the power of travel to create a more tolerant world. We're currently a network of 15 hostels organized as a nonprofit. We don't consider ourselves to be a heads and beds lodging provider. Our mission is larger than that. We're about promoting intercultural understanding, and we do that through building design, and we do that through our programs. Is High USA part of a larger global organization? We are. So we're the U.S. affiliate of the International Youth Hostel Federation. These days, IYHF is known as Hosteling International. IYHF has been around since the 30s and started in Europe. Hostels and youth travel are largely a European tradition that have moved to other parts of the world. So IYHF started back in 1932 when the Versailles Treaty was unraveling and Europe felt like it was heading to war and the European hosteling associations created IYHF to encourage young people to travel and learn about each other. High USA joined in 1933. Well, isn't that interesting? It kind of started as a peace movement. It did. And it was based on 20 years of experience that Europeans had with hostels. And they saw the benefits of youth travel and youth interacting with each other. And they felt like seemingly on the edge of another world war that was worth investing in hostels as a sort of peacemaking tool. Let's hit a few stats. How many hostels are there in the USA? So currently, I'd say 175 to 200, mainly in larger cities to cater to the international traveler. Before the pandemic, we were probably nearer to 300. The pandemic, of course, knocked the stuffing out of us, but we expect to be back to 300 soon. What percentage of guests come from outside the United States? So roughly 75%. Hosteling International USA hostels accommodate about two-thirds of our guests from overseas. Other hostels focus more on the international segment, but overall about 75%. How many overnight stays do hostels have in one year? Before the pandemic, I'd be really confident in saying about 5 million overnights a year. Wow. And now I would guess about half that. Still, it's sizable. Yeah, still two and a half million. I'm curious about the funding model. Are hostels funded solely from guest fees? Most hostels are. As a nonprofit, High USA receives some donations for our cultural exchange programming, but overwhelmingly we fund operations from guest fees. Are all hostels nonprofits? No, actually, High USA is one of the few nonprofits operating in the United States. Historically, most are privately owned hostels that are owned by former backpackers who returned from their travelers and decided to make hostels their business. It's a real motivating story. Recently, we've seen real estate companies and investors entering the field. In the States, the most prominent examples are brands called Generator and Freehand. How do consumers tell the difference? More importantly, does it matter to consumers? So hostels like hotel chains use online travel agencies. If you go to an online travel agency, you'll find hostels as well as hotel properties. And the online travel agencies do a pretty good job of distinguishing the differences. You see the amenities and the features for each of the individual hostels, and consumers are able to make their choice based on what they see. 
Here's our chat GPT question for this podcast, Russ. You ready for some artificial intelligence to ask you a question? Boy, I need artificial intelligence, Mark. <laughs> Don't we all? Here it comes. What are some of the benefits of staying in a hostel as opposed to a hotel or other types of accommodation? I would say affordability, the ability to meet and interact with other travelers as well as interact with the community, and sustainability. Hostels are inherently sustainable lodging choices and are fun and can be incredibly educational. Do you already work directly with DMOs in getting the word out about hosteling? We do. We're big supporters of our local DMOs. And with DMOs increasingly focused on community sustainability and local quality of life, I feel like we've never been so closely aligned. We're feeling their larger mission alignment. Historically, we'd look to DMOs as largely a business partner. Now we see them as mission partners as well. Talk to me about your sustainability awards and certifications and your environmental standards programs. So sustainability is the third pillar of what High USA is all about. And if you think about it, hostels as shared lodging ought to be more sustainable. Think of the last hotel room you're in. Three lamps and two overhead lights. Well, if you share that room with your partner, the average energy use is half. And if your two kids join you in the room, the average is a fourth of what that room would average for a single guest. And hostels are benefiting from that same advantage. So hostels have a running start. But High USA has gone beyond that by embracing conservation, renewable energy, and reuse strategies. We did a study in 2017, and our hostel guests left a carbon footprint of 1 20th of the average hotel guest. And that's very similar for water consumption as well. We've received recognition from our work. The two we're particularly proud of. High USA received a National Geographic Leader in Sustainable Tourism Award in 2017. We were one of five companies worldwide to receive that award. And in 2018, we were recognized by the UNWTO as one of 23 success case studies in terms of advancing UN sustainable tourism goals at our New York City hostel. Russ, I'd like to tap into some of your other experiences. You're a multi-term member of the U.S. Travel and Tourism Advisory Board. What's your experience been like, and can you share your perspective on the national travel and tourism strategy? Mark, serving on the TTAB has been an absolute pleasure. It's a relatively small group, about 30 people, and deeply experienced and opinionated, and we generate some really interesting insights together. The agenda, of course, is set by the Secretary of Commerce, Secretary Raimondo, with the NTTO staff. So it's been a way to bring youth and student travel and a youth and student travel lens to larger travel and tourism conversations. You ask me about the new travel and tourism strategy. To me, what's significant is that it reflects the trajectory of American life. A couple of weeks ago, I was listening to a U.S. Travel Association press conference, and Jeff Freeman was making the point how travel's growth and success is integral to practically everything in the United States. And of course, he's right. Travel influences our economy, our national security, education, and jobs. So when the strategy calls out themes such as diverse travel experiences and sustainable travel and tourism, to me, it's taking a broad view and a long view, and I like that because it becomes much more relevant to our kids' future. And for me, that needs to be the bottom line. I've learned so much about hosteling today, Russ. Thanks so much for spending time with me. It's even made me rethink about possibly staying in a hostel myself. (laughs) Thanks again for being here. Mark, you're always welcome. Thank you for having me. That's Brand USA Talks Travel. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. Your feedback is welcome. Email us at podcast at thebrandusa.com or call 202-793-6256. Brand USA Talks Travel is produced by Asher Mirovich, who also composes music and sound. Engineering by Brian Watkins. Please share this podcast with your friends in the travel industry. You may also enjoy many of our archived episodes, which you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Safe travels.